Right. Um, hi everyone, my name is Haley. I'm a PhD candidate in the Ecology, Evolution and Marine Biology Department. There's, uh, it's a mouthful. Um, and today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about data science in the classroom, uh, some of the struggles or obstacles that I've encountered, and then some of the strategies that i found to be fairly successful in addressing those. Um, so, as educators, I feel like our first job is to remind people that you don't need to be an expert coder in order to use a form of data science in your day-to-day -day work. And I think that's one of the largest misconceptions that we as educators have to work through. So here at UCSB, it's really neat. We have a whole community of organizations on campus that are structured purely to introduce students to their very first experience with data science and then support them as they learn additional skills and share those with others. So I participated in a couple of these myself. The Software Carpentry Workshop holds regular workshops here in the library. There's an eco data science group that actually partners with another group in downtown Santa Barbara. So there's lots of resources for students outside the classroom here as well. Um, so I just wanted to sort of ground this talk today in saying that I've done a lot of thinking about data science uh, because my own initial personal experience with learning data science was frankly pretty challenging and frustrating. And so I've since put a lot of thought and effort into thinking about how to make uh, access to data science um, a little less painful and a little more fun for students. So the way that I approach most of my courses is uh, sort of twofold. First, I think a lot about the mathematical concepts that are involved, various numbers and perhaps statistical methods, um, but also the language concepts because a lot of the structure in terms of teaching data science involves equipping your students with the vocabulary and the structure and the syntax that they need. Language, even though that in this case is a programming language. So let's talk about a couple of the obstacles that I regularly encounter. Um, the first is most students have no point of reference. They don't know anyone that currently does any form of data science. And the whole concept itself is fairly large and vague. And so that in and of itself can be really, really disheartening just from the get-go for most students. We also have, oftentimes, a very, very large amount of numbers and functions. And just this week, I had a student actually pull up an Excel file that had maybe four or five tabs full of numbers on it. And she immediately turned to her friend and said, oh my goodness, this is so stressful. That was her first reaction. So this is something that we really have to work through because students can quickly just sort of shut down or become overwhelmed um, just initially starting out. And finally, this is perhaps the most challenging, a lot of students I encounter have this internalized notion that they're somehow bad at math or bad at languages or bad at both. And uh, so they've somehow internalized that it's too late for them to learn this new skill. And it's our role as educators to come in and say, no, there's actually a lot of opportunity. So as you noticed, most of these obstacles have almost nothing to do with the concepts themselves, but rather perceptions of either data science or the student's self-perception, which I found to be fairly interesting. So the strategies that I've come up with address, for the most part, those perceptions. First, I typically use a really active learning design. So I just typically code on my laptop. I'll have it, have it set up like this. Um, and students can follow along as I'm coding. Um, so I don't present the code to them ahead of time. I typically have them follow along. And inevitably, you may have some students fall behind in case you go a little bit too quickly. But the added benefit of that is they'll typically then turn to their neighbor and start to talk about what's going on and ask them for help on that step. And so you basically have a little parent share going on without actually trying to structure that into the lecture, which is pretty cool. Um, in addition, I make sure to equip my students with the basic building blocks they need. Uh, this may seem really straightforward, but the vast majority of students that come into my classrooms still really struggle with things like Excel. And so being able to equip them with those basic tools will then later enable them to be much more creative. Um, so the basic vocabulary and structure will then later allow them to become truly fluent in whatever it is we're trying to teach them. And then finally, this is the most important, 
really, really uh, repeat all the concepts that I'm applying in class in assignments and then finally in exams and provide a lot of encouragement. Um, so one of the most interesting, challenging, and maybe rewarding parts of data science is that there's no right or wrong answer in most cases and students are often uh, conditioned to this sort of binary and you have to help them shift towards something where they can actually come up with an entirely different or new way of approaching a problem. Um, so at first, you'll have a lot of students coming to you saying, what's the right answer? Did I get this right? Does this look right? And as an educator, I feel it's really my job to shift them towards, OK, how's a new way that we can think through this? And once they reach that point, it's really rewarding, but it does require a lot of encouragement in the beginning, because especially with things like programming and data science, your students will probably get a lot of error messages. And in the very beginning, they get very scared by that, um, because they're sort of immediately programmed. They themselves are programmed to sort of see that failure <laughs> and think, OK, something's terribly wrong. I, I, there must be something wrong with me. Um, another amazing thing about data science is because it's now becoming so open source is you can have them actually start Google things or look things up online. And they'll quickly realize that there's an entire community of people who are having the exact same issues they are. Um, and it makes them feel a lot less alone in the process. So, I found that the classroom strategies, while simultaneously teaching the concepts, often just help to sort of reevaluate these perceptions they had when they first arrived in the classroom. So by combining both the mathematical uh, sort of logical structure with this language structure, I found that it creates a really nice holistic way of approaching data science. So when we equip our students with the basics that they need to then go on and succeed, as well as a really personalized learning experience, recognizing everyone's going to learn and then apply it a little bit differently, I found a lot of success. So my students typically walk away really excited to apply whatever they've learned in a new context. Also, this is a really cool tool that you can then talk about a whole bunch of peripheral skills. So in addition to learning whatever concepts uh, or themes in class, it's a great thing to put on their resume for future employers. And they might be more accustomed to now doing data visualization or management, which is applicable in a whole bunch of scenarios. And then I also always take care to pair my data science lectures with something having to do with communication. Um, because it's really important for students not only to have a firm grounding in data science and those concepts, but then also be able to communicate the results to others as well. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the people that have supported my own data science transformation, um, especially Allison Horst. I'm not sure if any of you know of her, but she's an excellent educator and data science proponent, um, currently working in the Bren School. Um, and she was a instrumental figure in helping me not only learn data science just a couple of years ago, but also think critically about how to best educate others about it as well. And with that, um, I'd welcome any questions or your own experiences. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, when you're teaching like multi-level classrooms where mm -hmm. some people with a lot of prior experience and then some with like zero experience, mm -hmm. you manage that if you have like so many students that you can't just like individually kind of answer questions during class. Mm -hmm. In that part, I really like to break things up. So uh, for the first part, I like to focus on whatever basic skill it is that I'm trying to focus on. Acknowledging the people who are more advanced may start to drift a little in that first part. But then I will give them an, them an, an example that they'll have to work through in class. So then those that feel they've already mastered it will go ahead and work through it on their own, whereas those that might need a little extra help, I can go around and help. Um, and the really nice thing is, I've seen this in a couple other structures and in my current classroom, is if you have additional TAs currently in the class with you and treat it as more of a lab, then you can actually walk around and help people work out bugs. Um, and I found that to be extremely helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you, do you suggest your students bring in their own laptops, or do you use the universities? Um, it all depends on what classroom I'm in. So I, the one of the classrooms I currently teach in is in Psych, and so we actually use the JMP that, that are on those laptops. Um, but since R is another language we I often use, and that's open source, um, often students will just bring their own laptops as well. Yeah, yeah, it really depends. But I think it is best just to be certain everyone has access to pick a room if you can, where they have the option of using a monitor. Yes. Well, I'm interested because a lot of data, data science tends to be oriented around computer science students, and mm -hmm. I'm seemingly uh, interested in like what kinds of 
data you've been able to get your students to use and like what you've gotten them excited about? Because I know yeah. a lot of students that take CS classes find it this like non-transferable to environmental data science. So mm -hmm. what kind of problems that's going to be? Yeah, so I've worked through a whole variety of problem sets. So if you're looking for more scientific data, sometimes you just need to pick something really concrete, like uh, national park visitors by year. And so they can filter by national park. They can have an emotional connection to maybe when they visited. Um, another one that's really cool is there's a package in R that actually mines tweets off of Twitter. And so if you are looking at things from a linguistic standpoint, you can actually uh, match up vocabulary with sort of strength of emotion. And then you can start to analyze tweets based on what anger or happiness is being emoted, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so I think, like many have said this morning, it's really all about knowing your audience and thinking about what example you think is going to be most applicable and interesting to them. Yeah. There's also, if you're interested, there's lots of cool um, open source data sites, so I can tell you about those afterwards where you can get any of these data sets for free also. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.